Welcome to Rev Reads. Thank you for joining me today. We are privileged with an author interview. We have uh, Dr. Michael Spiegel here from Dallas Theological Seminary, and I'm I'm super excited. I just got done reading his The Fathers on the Future, and I don't know if you've all seen sort of that classic uh, movie, uh, Mr. Holland's Opus, where uh, Mr. Holland's trying to write his main uh, musical the whole time. You end up seeing at the end of the movie, you know, his his class ends up being, you know, his opus and all of his students. Well, I feel like the Fathers on the Future was so good that like we are looking at uh, Dr. Spiegel's opus uh, with the Fathers on the Future. So I, I thought it was great. So thank you so much for coming here on Rev Reads. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I was wondering if you just start by just giving us a brief uh, overview, like a, like a 30 second snapshot of what people can expect going into the fathers in the future. Yeah, I like to frame the fathers on the future as yes, it is a delve into a patristic or early Christian eschatology. What did the earliest church fathers believe? But it's not just that. Uh, I'd say I take a, a Berean approach. I say, here's what the early fathers were saying. Let's go to the scriptures and see if what they say is true. And so it's putting together uh, the earliest patristic consensus, what you see among uh, people like Justin and Irenaeus, second century, the, the next first and second generations after the apostles, and then showing in scripture that uh, for the most part, with a few tweaks, uh, what they say can, comports very well with what scripture teaches through a, just a normal exegetical method. Yeah, I think one of the things that surprised me at the book is that there is a little more, more there's more exegesis in the book than I thought. I thought it would be more... Uh, just bringing up, uh, you know, quotes of the father and examining what they said, which I appreciated. Um, I actually, actually liked the format of that. But the one thing I was thinking as I was reading through this, and, and I'd love to get your answer for this, if someone wanted to be a really good Berean before reading this book, not that anyone, I think, needs to read these initial documents first, sure. um, because I think you do a good job uh, allowing the reader to see in context what's going on and what they're saying. But if someone was like, I want to read them myself before reading The Fathers on the Future, uh, mm -hmm. what would you encourage somebody to read to be ready in advance uh, for this? Yeah, so these are ancient documents. We have, uh, they're originally written in uh, Greek or, or Latin. We have text in Latin and some other languages. Uh, they are, most of them are available uh, in the public domain in very old translations. So you can go to, you know, the anti, not anti, anti Nicene Fathers, A N T E N I C E N E, anti Nicene Fathers. You can do a search uh, and find a number of these works online for free. There is, um, uh, I would start with uh, the, the Didache, the last chapter of Didache 16, Barnabas 15 is important. But then uh, especially Justin Martyr has some chapters in there where he deals with eschatology, but primarily Irenaeus of Lyon from the second century. His book five of Against Heresies, pretty much chapters 25 to the end are uh, almost an exposition of uh, early Christian eschatology. So a lot of the, and there's of course different writings in between, but I'm showing that these were, these writings were more or less kind of pointing in the same direction, but uh, the Antinocene Fathers volume one, um, it's about 120 years old, the, the translation, but it's available. There are newer translations out there as well, but that would get them started. Yeah, and I think I think you can get the Anti-Nicene Fathers Volume 1 on Kindle for $1.99 mm -hmm. if someone wanted it in that format. Uh, but I think one thing I think I want to make sure to clear with what you're saying is that that's not a lot of material to read, what you just listed there. Like, it's not a ton. Like, if you were to read through all of Irenaeus's writings, that's obviously, you know, it's, it's a chunky, I got it on my bookshelf there. It's a, it's a chunky book, right. but, but just book five, uh, starting at 25 isn't a ton. Uh, you're not talking about all the Didache. So, uh, I, I think it's reasonable if someone wanted to, to look mm -hmm. at the original sources for all of those, like we're not talking tons, tons, tons of reading to, right. to get to all of it. Uh, so you're looking at these original source writings, what they believed on eschatology. Uh, so why do the views of these particular church fathers matter so much, probably in comparison to what follows after? Yeah, so uh, everybody, I hope, is agreeing here, and I'm assuming most of your viewers understand, Scripture is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. It is uh, written by the apostles and prophets. It's, it's infallible. It's authoritative. It's inerrant. 
and all of our doctrinal practical questions are, are measured by that standard. So I don't want anybody to think that, you know, all matters of faith and practice are measured by what Irenaeus of Lyon or somebody said. But really the question is, uh, you know, what did what is the the eschatology, the, the view of the end times that is left by these writers of scripture to that very next generation as they're doing what 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, the things you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful men, right? Who will be able to teach others also. And we have names, you know, of those people. So that first generation of Timothy and Clement and Ignatius, and then you have Polycarp, all who were who were disciples of the apostles, and then they had disciples. So Justin and Irenaeus and and some of these other people from the second century that we're looking at uh, are part of that first to second generation after the apostles. And so the the thesis is the claim is look uh, if these earliest fathers that first and second generation right after the apostles were saying basically the same thing on any area of theology, whether that's their view of Christ and his resurrection and the gospel and and these kinds of things. Uh, we should take that into consideration because it's highly likely, highly probable. In fact, the burden of proof is on someone who challenges this. It's highly likely that they're simply reflecting that which the apostles taught them as they're handing them off the scriptures and teaching them to pass these things on to the next generation. And when it comes to eschatology, not every single detail, but the big picture things like what is the nature of the coming kingdom? Uh, is the tribulation period yet futures or it something in the past? Is there a real antichrist? These kinds of things, uh, they speak uh, unanimously on. When they're not silent on the issue, because, of course, not everybody's writing a treatise on eschatology, they're saying basically the same thing as the thesis. And where do they likely get that? Well, they, they got it from their teachers, who were the apostles or the very disciples of the apostles. So that's the that's why we should be interested in them. They become the theological historical context within which the apostles themselves were doing their ministry and passing this faith off to the next generation. Yeah, which then makes me me always wonder, like, why isn't there not a, a bigger focus on, I'd say, like, from Irenaeus, you know, and then earlier, because because they're so close. But I do feel like, by and large, when people talk about church early church fathers, they almost get ignored sometimes in comparison to the guys that wrote so much more. Um, so, so I love this book, like, you know, shining a light right, right on these guys. And what I found most interesting in the book is one of the things that I appreciate, and that is uh, their view on revelation. So I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about how they viewed revelation, history, prophecy, describing the age that they're mm -hmm. living in. How did they view that book in particular? Yeah, so the book of Revelation itself, right out the gate, you have uh, references to this this book or allusions to it. it in, in the second century, from about 100 to 200, it is a, an extremely well-attested book. It's, you know, there's an urban legend myth out there that the book of Revelation, you know, wasn't canonized until the fourth or fifth century. Well, it was quoted from as they, they were saying John the Apostle wrote it. Justin mentions this. The Muratorian canon in the late second century talks about it as part of the canon. Um, Irenaeus does a virtual exposition of this thing, saying, Look, I knew the guy who knew the author, and here's, <laughs> you know, we know who wrote it and when it came to us. So it's very well attested as, as authoritative. And they viewed it as re referring to things in the future. So they understood that uh, this was pr primarily pointing to future events, a future antichrist, a future period of, of a seven-year, two witnesses, literal witnesses who are going to prophesy. So what futurism calls, what, what's called futurism today, uh, viewing the book of Revelation primarily referring to uh, a period of, of end times events, that was the the general consensus in the second century. And did they um, did they take it as a a specific time period, like like a three and a half seven year type time period when they looked at Revelation? Yeah, it's interesting. The idea of the Antichrist reigning Revelation thirteen for forty two months or three and a half years that is actually a. a something that's held very early on, right from the start. Justin Martyr mentions it in the middle of the second century. Um, and then Irenaeus, of course, mentions it as uh, the the abomination of desolation, Daniel chapter 9, corresponding to that second half related to the reign of the Antichrist. So he places the 70th week of Daniel, in fact, into the future, as does very clearly his disciple Hippolytus of Rome. 
um, places the uh, 70th week of Daniel in the future and corresponding and those correspond to events in the book of Revelation itself. So so that futurist view of Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Second Thessalonians 2, uh, Matthew 24, many of its elements and Revelation um, 13, 11, 12, 13, they all pushing that forward, saying we have the seven year period divided into two, two witnesses in the first half, two beasts in the second. And that's a, a yet future period. Man, and it's crazy that that's what it is. And one of the things I liked about your book is I, I taught through Revelation uh, recently in my church. And one of the passages that I guess, you know, gave me the most headaches, and, and it does, I think most people who, who look at it is talking about the mark of the beast, because mm -hmm. there's like, you know, probably not only is, is the number 666, but that probably signifies that there are 666 theories <laughs> as to what the mark of the beast is. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed uh, just your little part on there. So I was wondering if you could share just briefly what's in the book on regarding that mark of the beast. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, the, the fathers kind of go in a couple of different directions because you have to understand that even when they take something literally, they sometimes also want to draw out spiritual application or, or make other connections. So so sometimes people point to some of their spiritual applications of it and say, see, they took it spiritually. But if you kind of look at the fathers as a whole and Irenaeus in particular, he understood the 666 number as referring to um, the the letters, either Greek or Latin or, or Hebrew, uh, the, the letters of a future Antichrist's name adding up to 666. And that was going to be a clue for Christians kind of early to, to identify this person and avoid them in a sense. So it was, they took it very literally in that sense. He even uh, was a, a, aware of some people who changed it, he says, uh, to 616 to try to make it match Nero. And he talks about, you know, but I knew the guy who wrote it. I knew the guy who knew the guy who wrote it. And we know that the original number was 666. He actually pulls, you know, the name drops there to try to uh, demonstrate that 666 is the original original number. So they took it literally as referring to the name of the, the Antichrist in the future. Which is crazy with all the theories that are out there, that they, not only did they have this view, but that they seemingly uh, were so dogmatic about. Like, like we're, we're telling you this is exactly what it is. And we know without a shadow of a doubt, like there's not like we're guessing at this. It seemed like it was one of the things in your book that I walked away with saying that Irenaeus was probably more confident on uh, was the significance of the mark of the beast. Yeah. But, but he also does warn us about trying to speculate about yeah, who what the name gonna is going to be. Yeah. He said, you know, look, there are a lot of names that in Greek or whatever can add up to 666. And he he does say it. that's what it is. It is a, a number of a name, but let's wait until the actual guy shows up, not just jump the conclusions, you know? So it's he is cautious yeah. about this. So he's not a sensationalist, but he does say, look, this is, and let's be honest, uh, an exegesis, a basic exegesis of that text seems to be you calculate the number of the name. And it yeah. does oh, yeah. to be the, the most self-evident interpretation of that. No, and I love the, the no speculation point. Like it just shows his wisdom uh, that yeah. he knew what people were going to do. Like he didn't need to live in the, you know, 20th century, although the 20th century was nothing new for people trying to figure out who the Antichrist was. If you spend any time, you know, actually reading people from church history, you realize people were doing that all the time thousand years yeah yeah and so it's funny that like he oh he he saw a problem that was gonna happen for all of those years yeah warned us about it and we didn't follow that warning and we've been you know paying for it ever since exactly. so it's, it's one of those great moments in that book where it's not a huge thing but it's like oh it just shows his his wisdom and how he he saw what was going to happen and sort of was trying to guard us from the very beginning. But sadly we got this great writing that we're ignoring too much, which is what I love about your book. Cause it's drawing attention to it. Thanks. Um, and, and so, so moving on from that, let's, let's talk about the good part of eschatology and that is the millennial kingdom. And I got to say, uh, I, I loved your writing on the nature of Christ's kingdom when he rules on earth and the purpose of Christ's kingdom when he rules on earth. Cause it's, it's a little different than how 
I saw it or how I guess it'd been presented to me, you know, in the church and all uh, growing up. So I was wondering if you could talk about uh, what Christ's millennial reign will be like and, and more important, like like the purpose of of that time period. So um, yeah. just take as long as you want, because I, I yeah, love no. I, I think you're right. I remember, uh, you know, explanations, you know, why is there going to be a millennial kingdom? Why is is he going to bind Satan for a thousand years? And why would he let him go at the end? And all of these questions. And, and I, I was often told, well, the reason for the millennial kingdom is because he has all these Old Testament conditions that need to be fulfilled. And he needs a place to do it. OK, that's true. And Irenaeus even says this, you know, you can't allegorize all these prophecies that have to be fulfilled in the in the real world, their worldly, you know, earthy promises but there's more to it than that so it's not not that but there's much more so Irenaeus has an understanding that this is the uh the the pro the stage upon which the original plan of the what, what I call identification of creation that humanity had this mission to be fruitful multiply fill the earth subdue it exercise dominion and and in a sense terraform to use a sci-fi term the, the world to make it like the the quality of heaven on earth that like Eden and that didn't happen because of the fall. God doesn't have a plan B. He is going to get, accomplish it through Christ and the second humanity, the glorified humanity. And that's the stage upon which this world will be uh, progressively liberated from its bondage to corruption and transformed into heaven on earth, like the quality of paradise. So, so that's what we're going to be doing. Humans are going to fulfill that mission that we had from the very beginning. To me, that's exciting. Um, another one is where, and this is a, probably going to be a very foreign to a lot of people who are taught, you know, you die and, you know, you are everything you would ever be. You know, Irenaeus and a lot of these early church fathers understood um, our resurrection as the beginning of this eternal growth in knowledge of and love for and and um, submission to uh, God and his and his word and his kingdom and these kinds of things that were constantly growing positively from glory to glory, they would say this is what's sometimes called progressive glorification. And it makes sense that we're not just suddenly going to know everything, that we are creatures and God has this trajectory. And part of the process of growth is going to occur during that millennial period. It's a he he uses this interesting phrase that is a it is a period during which we become accustomed to immortality. Uh, and we're, we're fellowshipping with God and with angels and, and these kinds of things. So it's a very dynamic picture of, of post-resurrection humanity as we're in glory. It's not floating around in a cloud, strumming a harp. It's doing stuff and living out the purpose for being human in the, in the uh, Imago Dei mission, as I call it. So those are a couple of things. It is also a place where uh, promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the the restoration of Jerusalem and Israel being fulfilled, believing Israel, the nations being blessed, the, the world being um, bountiful and fruitful and all of these things uh, are, are also also part of it, which has been kind of the, the classic approach. But it's so much more than that. And I think it's really exciting. Yeah, what I love about how you wrote and I, I, I was like, I, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, I wish I could have always known this. Because when I taught, I taught eschatology in my first church, which was in rural upstate New York. So like half of my church, uh, like worked at Cornell University and like the other half were farmers. So it was kind of like an interesting mix of church. Like, like I, I love the people there, but as I was talking about eschatology at one time, uh, one of the ladies in my church who had a farm, like I was talking about it and she's like, I don't like it. And I'm like, I'm like, why don't you like it? She's, she's like, well, we're, we're going to rule with Christ. And she's like, I don't want to be a ruler. I don't want to uh, like manage an office or something. She's like, I cannot picture any way that this is a good picture future for us. But when you paint it as the, we're going to redo the Eden, like, like the earth is going to be so messed up at the end of the tribulation uh, and everything with sin, and we got to remake it. Like all of a sudden, this takes somebody who's in this agricultural lifestyle, and it's like, oh, well, that's you know, that's something I can totally sign up for. Wh which then, which then got me thinking even more reading this. And I hope I'm not taking too much long time saying this because this is just super exciting to me. Because that then got me thinking even more though. Aren't the people who were the initial 
students of the word, the people that were getting the scripture, the people that were going to synagogue before Christ came or the early church, weren't the majority of them up until the modern era. They were agricultural because that's what everybody did. So actually, the, when I was thinking about this more after reading your book, like that mindset of the farmer in my church is probably more reflective of the mindset that Jesus and the Spirit and the authors of Scripture would want to get excited rather than the politician and the seminary professor, because yeah. they're the people in the church. Exactly. And so wouldn't it not make sense that the millennial kingdom and the way it is would get those people excited yeah. about being in the kingdom? And being active, you know, ruling, yeah. it, the whole theme of ruling is starts at the very beginning with the exercise dominion, subdue the world, exercise dominion, be my mediators of my, my rule in this world. And that's, that's what it means to rule. We, we pay, yeah. I remember years ago, my youngest child, when he was just barely kind of talking and I was teaching him about Jesus, et cetera, as you do with your kids. And, and I said, so, so where is Jesus right now? What is he doing? And he thought about it and he thought, and he said, him sit on him king throne and him tell people what to do. You know, that was like that. That was it. That's what Jesus did. He's up there sitting on a chair. And I just I had a I thought that was cute. But then I thought, you know, that's not what what ruling me. Kings spend very little time actually sitting on thrones, even in the real world, you know, or even wearing crowns maybe once in a while. Uh, but we I can't imagine how many Christians think that yeah, we're going to get to heaven, sit on thrones and have crowns and sit there and and we're you're going to enjoy it. Darn it. You know, he'll transform your heart. So you will. No, no, no. Exercising dominion from day one was spreading the boundaries of eating and eating the blessings of heaven into this world. And we're going to it's an active rule. We are going to get our hands dirty, so to speak. And I think that's way more exciting. I'm telling you what. Most people, if they're honest, they're not excited about dying, going to heaven and floating around in a white, ethereal, cloudy. No, moment. no one is. Yeah, Nobody is. No, and I love it. And I, I don't know if it was the last quote in the book. It might have been um, when you say they forget to die. Yeah, Irenaeus says that, you know, that yeah. the times of the kingdom, those who are in the earth will then forget to die. The righteous who are on the earth will then forget to die. It's a great, that's a great uh, image. Like you're enjoying life yeah. so much. It's like, oh, wait, it's just about it. oh, I forgot to die. Yeah. Great. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful way to, way to look at it and go. Uh, so, so going from just more good to more good. Um, so we have the millennial kingdom. And then you also talk in this book a decent amount about paradise. Mm -hmm. And I wanted you to talk about paradise a little bit because I've had numerous people ask me about paradise. This is one of those subjects that like, I've gotten asked about it, people in church, people online, like ask me about paradise all the time. And one of my answers usually is like, it's mentioned like three times in the Bible. Like, like there's only so much uh, we can say, but I would love for you to share well, what you got from your study on the early church fathers and what they saw is paradise. Yeah. So, you know, kind of I, I start in, you know, Jewish intertestamental second temple um, literature. These some of these terms like a like paradise and abyss and kingdom, they have meanings by the time you get to the first century and Jesus is teaching and, and the, the scriptures are being written in the first century. So uh, our our as interpreters, we have to read. I like to say, read the Bible the way it was meant to be read. Read it in its historical grammatical context. Read words the way they would have been understood at the time. So the term paradise had uh, developed a, a pretty um, technical concept to, uh, sense in the first century as a reference to the Garden of Eden. And the <laughs> I know this is going to sound really weird. The first time I encountered this, you know, 20 years ago, I thought it was weird, but you get used to it. And it was the idea after Adam and Eve fell and were expelled from the garden, the question of what happened to the Garden of Eden, you know, is it, it was it walk, washed away in the flood? Did it wither up and die? These kinds of things. And normally, it, it, the this is, sounds weird, but it's actually biblical. It God took it. You know, God is the one who planted Eden, the garden on the, on the earth, paradise. And he, in a sense, scooped it up and brought it into what's called the third heaven. I know that sounds weird, but... You'll never read the New Testament the same way again if you realize when Paul talks about being caught up to the third heaven and paradise in 2 Corinthians and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's the abode of, of uh, Enoch and Elijah when they were caught up. 
it's the place where the departed saints go, th those who are are saved. So it it has a, a a story behind it, even by the time you get to the first century. And when Jesus says, you know, he who overcomes will eat from the tree of life, which is present tense in the paradise of God. And so part of the story that's being told from Genesis to Revelation is this longing for and this return, not to paradise, but of paradise. And so part of the early premillennial understanding was that's precisely what this is. It's Christ returning and bringing with him his tree of life in the paradise of God and creation itself being transformed into likeness of paradise. So it's uh, it's interesting if you kind of follow paradise through Jewish understanding, early Christian understanding, you realize it's not just at the beginning of the story and disappears, it's coming back. And that's why you see that imagery of the tree of life and the river of life and, and paradise in the book of Revelation itself. So, so then a couple of follow-up questions. Um, is the New Jerusalem paradise? Uh, that's how I take it. I, you know, it, I take Revelation as a series of symbolic visions with actual reference in the future. So, actually, uh, hold on, pause just for a second. Yeah. Is is and just for those who are watching, I'm talking about the New Jerusalem at the end of Revelation, yeah, chapter 20. Just making sure all the viewers know that we're on right. the same page. Talking about that giant city, yeah, uh, that comes down. Make sure that yeah. everybody's on the same page. That's what we're talking about. Um, exactly. So, yeah, continue. So, are those two the same? Yeah, so I take it as that that vision that John sees of this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven okay. with the tree of life and everything. I take that as a symbol, um, not merely a symbol of nothing, but a symbol of what is going to happen in the future when the dwelling of God, the the heavenly realm comes, you know, occupied by the saints of the Old Testament and the new is going to return to this earth. And that is, I think, a symbol of the, the restoration of paradise or Eden, what we call the Garden of Eden. Uh, back to this earth and this transformation of creation. It's there is, um, and this is in the book, Old Testament, uh, or sorry, intertestamental uh, literature that does equate uh, Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, or the new Jerusalem with uh, paradise of Eden. So, as the dwelling place of the saints. So, by the time the book of Revelation is written and, and uses that imagery that God has given to John, it does have that, that connotation in the minds of the original readers. So paradise would be what God, it was Eden that God, mm -hmm. the garden God put on earth. Yeah. So that means it's not equated with heaven because heaven was still heaven yeah. while paradise was here. But then paradise was brought up to heaven. So it's the, the city, the, the garden is in heaven mm -hmm. right now. When a Christian dies, do they go to paradise? Are they dwelling in paradise in heaven? Is that the I believe so. view that the fathers would have yeah. or yeah we're, we're we're there um awaiting resurrection i believe we are conscious that the whole last chapter is what happens to us when we die and so i take the classic christian view that uh to be absent from the body is to be present with the lord in paradise in this place of rest and repose but we're not sleeping it's not soul sleep we are conscious um i i, I don't want to speculate about what the passage of time is like in a disembodied state but it could be longer could be shorter uh, from our right it could drag on it could go quickly i don't know um, but we are conscious moses and elijah appearing with jesus talking about you know the things that are going to happen in jerusalem demonstrates that and the, the church and has always held that but um but that's not the ultimate hope the ultimate hope is to be resurrected in new bodies that paradise itself to return to earth and and dwelling forever in the the new heavens the new earth so it is important to understand paradise is not merely heavenly and ethereal but it's not just um, mortal corruptible substance. It's sort of a, uh, the father's described as an in-between, an intermediate condition of the qualities, both heaven, heavenly and earthly. So you remember in second Corinthians where Paul talks about, I knew a man 14 years ago, he was caught yeah. up in paradise of the third heaven. And he says in there twice, I don't know if I was, it, it was in the body or out of the body. I don't know. Because in, in typical Jewish understanding at the time, paradise was able to accommodate both physical as well as spiritual beings. And that that phrase, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body, is very much in keeping with the nature of paradise as both heavenly and earthly in, in many ways. So basically, if we could 
if someone felt like they could totally describe whether it's earthly or heavenly, they'll probably be going against Paul because Paul would be like, I've been there and I can't tell you whether it is earthly or spiritually. Exactly. Uh, I don't know if I was in the body. I thought, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, an interesting way to put it. Um, I, I've been trying to, you know, make sense of those three passages and how to relate them and the tree of life being in it. And it's sort of seeming like it's spiritual and physical. And so sometimes I've told people like, I think paradise is just existence with Jesus Christ. And if you're with Christ, you know, you're, you're in paradise. But I think, I think I like the the view that you brought out in the book better. Like I thought that was one of the, the good parts. I was like, Oh, that's a nice way to explain and, uh, take what we have from those three verses and uh, and put them all together. So there's there's a lot in this book that to me just it just makes sense. Um, the futuristic view of revelation, it just makes sense. Uh, this view of the millennial kingdom, like I said, like it just it really makes sense. like it like it allows for a great hope for the future that I think we've sort of robbed from people in the church by not being able to have enough emphasis on it and in their hope for eternity. I, I, I like the way paradise works together here. And so there's just a lot in this book uh, that you're really unearthing with providing what the early church fathers had in comparison to the scriptures that just, it, all of this just seems to, to fit so well, like the puzzle pieces just go in and then these views kind of died out. Can you just give me your theory of why, why these just kind of petered out, you know, a hundred to yeah. 200 years after this? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do kind of deal with that. I do talk about the the kind of decline in that premillennial futurist hope of the earthly kingdom, and then kind of the rise of the more spiritual understanding, the all millennial view, or more realized eschatology. So, there's several reasons, and and this has been written about in a lot by a lot of authors um, who have have traced the history of this. And I think I give like uh, five reasons and I can run through them really, really quickly, but you can go to the book. I think it's uh, page 60 something in the book. But one of the reasons is, um, it, you know, premillennialism was regarded by later sophisticated academic fathers as kind of naive and simple. Um, you know, they they talk about the, the simple minded who don't, you know, understand that they, they take the Bible too literally and they don't understand it's, it's a little more complicated than that. It's sometimes... Um, also coupled with what we call Platonism or dualism, where you've separated physical and spiritual into two categories, exalted the spiritual and downplayed the physical. And that sense, a kind of a heavenly spiritual kingdom is way better than an earthly physical kingdom. So once you've done that, another one is the, um, the, the rise of the allegorical method. And so even though they aren't going to deny, for instance, historical accounts, they they jump that from that quickly into moral application or spiritual application or something like that. And so a, a in that context, a, a physical earthly kingdom as the fulfillment of these Old Testament hopes feels uh, inferior to more moral or spiritual application. Um, there is also the reality of the political changes that have occurred in the fourth, fifth century with Constantine and then the legalization and and making Christianity the the, the state religion in 380 and with that the story that christ is going to come back destroy the wicked empire and replace it with his kingdom doesn't sell well right it's you know christ is going to come back destroy the christian empire and all of the churches that they built in the you know it doesn't make any more sense so this impetus to say well well maybe this is the outworking of the spiritual kingdom that we've been hoping for and then finally and and i don't want to overplay this but we also can't downplay it uh especially deeper into church history if anything sounded too jewish uh the the anti-judaism and anti-semitism that became pretty common especially in the late patristic and into the medieval period and especially reformation um if something sounded too Jewish, as did a physical earthly kingdom on this earth and centered in Jerusalem, oh, yeah. that itself cast the view in, in a negative light. So it doesn't mean that if you're a millennial, you're anti-Semitic. That's that's absolutely not true. But if you're an anti-Semite, anything like an earthly kingdom is not going to be your cup of tea. Well, I mean, it was called the Jewish view at times, wasn't it? Like the Exactly. Idea of, yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, so th- those are good reasons as to why to why it died out. And so it kind of makes sense that we don't have it anymore, which is a shame. But uh, we can go back and, and draw it back out, even though it was uh, seemingly lost for about a thousand years. Uh, so now let's uh, let's let's transition to the the I'd say the juicy topic because whenever you talk about eschatology, the juiciest topic is always the rapture, the assumption of the church. Like that's always what you know people want to debate about. It's funny here, like with the book reviews I do, like I'll have times where or I I never touch on the rapture. Never ne- doesn't come up at all in anything that I say. Uh, but just the fact that somebody knows I'm a dispensationalist. Um, I'll get these comments on my videos, like about how like I'm an idiot for uh, for for believing in the rapture, even if it's something that like I'm like I didn't even talk about that then. Like give it a rest. Um, so let let's talk about the juicy thing uh, for for a few minutes, uh, and that is you spend uh, a good amount of time on Revelation twelve five and the assumption of the church now, and that that is teaching the rapture. Now I'm just going to be honest. As soon as you talked about finding the rapture in Revelation chapter 12, my eyes rolled up in the back of my head. Uh, I say that because uh, when I first became a pastor here in New Orleans, I read three or four books on Mary uh, to understand the Catholic view on Mary, just because I want to be able to talk with intelligence, you know, when I share the gospel with uh, with Roman Catholics. And of course, the passage that they always run to is Revelation 12. And and by the time I got done reading those books, I was like, if anybody builds any theology based on Revelation 12, they're just, they're grasping for straws. And so as soon as I saw Revelation 12, I was like, oh boy. And then the verse, I'll just, I'll just read Revelation 12, 5 in uh, the New American Standard. Uh, it says, and she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And I read that, you know, and I'm like, I respect you, Dr. Spiegel. I respect you. Like, your book has been great so far. But when I got there, I was like, I don't know if I can take you onto that bridge. Uh, Walk that bridge with you that that verse uh, talks about the rapture of the church. And I would love for you to give just a Cliff's note reasoning as to why you can find the rapture of the church in Revelation 12, 5. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought it up. It is uh, it's probably the one that will draw the most maybe attention, positive or negative. Uh, it's, you know, I first started writing on Revelation 12, 5 and its role in both the history of the rapture doctrine because it I didn't come up with it. It's It was there in the 19th century. It was probably at least Darby and Kelly and some of those others advanced it as an exegetical argument for the pre-tribulation, pre-seven-year rapture. Because if the catching up of the male son is, uh, if the male son is an image of uh, the corporate body of Christ, the church, and the catching up is the rapture, uh, at that point, the the discussion's over. Uh, That event, everybody who reads that text, no matter who, how you identify the male son, believe it, it takes place prior to the seven-year period, uh, of the tribulation. So, um, so the question is, who is the identity of the woman? Who is the identity of the child? What's the identity of the dragon? Who's the identity of the rest of the woman's offspring at the end? And so it's a, it's, it's a very, I'm just going to say it's complicated because the issues relate to a lot of the primary language, Greek text, what old Testament texts are being alluded to. Uh, what are those texts? pointing to. Uh, I, I don't want to say it's a simple um, uh, argument, and and I strongly urge readers to suspend judgment until you read the chapter very carefully, read the footnotes. But um, I basically am going to throw down the gauntlet and say, given four presuppositions that I spell out in the chapter, uh, the argument for the pre-trib rapture in Revelation 12.5 is irrefutable. <laughs> And it takes, it is uh, taking, I, I make the case that the male son, the symbolism that is used there, the language, the pa- passages it's pointing us back to, which is not even debated, it's pointing us back to a corporate passage in Isaiah uh, by a, a dissonance of gra- grammatical, uh, a grammatical dissonance between the male son. And then uh, it 
and three other passages point us to an identification that this is not merely Christ. This is the body of Christ cast in terms of Christ because they share this destiny with him. And then mm -hmm. the term for catching up is harpazo, which I'm going to just say it. Uh, it's absolutely the wrong word if it's talking about the ascension of Jesus. That was the argument that got me the most. Yeah, I um, had in that chapter. Honestly, yeah. was the, the use of that term was the one that, um, like, like, like I'm, I'm, you know, standing at the edge, like not going with you. That was the one that kind of pushed me over the cliff. Was yeah, actually if, that, if, if it's that if it's the ascension of Jesus, he used the total wrong term, and yeah, it's a it's a an, it's a rescue passage. He's being rescued with the rapture. This and that's the word hapazo, same word as in First Thessalonians four. It's interesting. Years ago, when I taught this in class, I had a, a student, a Greek student, not a student of Greek, but a Greek student from Greece, coming to me the next class with. She brought a whole bunch of. Uh, ancient as well as um, modern lexica. And she said, nobody speaking Greek would use this word for the ascension. She said, you need to be, you need to push that argument even harder. She told me so, uh, but, but the rest of it, I, I do. And I'm going to stand by that. It's uh, given four presuppositions, which not everybody will hold. And I spell them out in there. Uh, if you allow for those four presuppositions, um, the argument is pretty, pretty solid. So, yeah, I, I mean, one of my struggles, um, I mean, just to be honest, like like holding to, you know, the the rapture view uh, is that in our camp, and you probably would say the same thing, we have some bad arguments. Like oh, yeah. there, there are some people that quote some verses where I'm just like, oh, <laughs> like, and and I don't know, like this, was, I feel like this was a, a really strong one. Um, maybe it, it's 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 slightly complicated, which is maybe why people don't don't go to it as mm -hmm. often. Um, and maybe that's what keeps it, you know, out of the mouths of the people who use the other arguments mm -hmm. that aren't as good is because it does take some some nuance and you got to know the the Old Testament background. But you're right. It is clearly there. The 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 male child is just like a male son is like flashing lights. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so you do make a good argument for it, but yeah, I mean, like initially I was like, this is going to be another one of those verses where I'm just going to be like, have I ever let you down, Sean? Have I ever? <laughs> no, you, you, I mean, I should have been like, if this guy wrote AI theist, he is going to nail this on revelation 12. Five. That's what I, that's what I should have said. Um, so, so I was, I was super nervous though. And I was like, this is going to go in my, my bag of bad pre-trib proof texts. But you know, you you saved it. I felt like it was a good a good verse. Um, not only a good verse, like this is this is I got to be one of the top ones. Like I asked Corey Marsh about it online, <laughs> and he was this, he was like he's like no, he's like this is like the best verse. And he's like once yeah. you once you hear his argument about it, like like it's it's excellent. I was like yeah, oh well, now that I've read the chapter, yeah. um, but you got you got to walk through it. So all that to say, um. And I, I think one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up in the interview, though, was that I wanted to point out that your book is not, you're not taking the superficial level proof text arguments for the rapture that are thrown out that everybody can just dismiss with a wave of a hand. Like the, the chapter you have and the exegesis on it, it is, it is, it is top notch. Like it is such a great chapter. And if somebody enjoys thorough Bible study, they're going to love reading that chapter because it is, it is a great Bible study to go through. So I just, you know, hats off. Uh, I, I thought it was, I thought it was, it was, it was a good chapter. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, and and, and let, let's go from revelation 12, five to, to the other, the other rapture question. And to me, this was the question I honestly had the most going into this book. Yeah. Um, because I've read Irenaeus. Um, so, you know, like, like the, the, if you read Irenaeus, the pre-mill stuff is like obvious future revelation stuff, obvious, but I was like, man, I just, I don't remember what he would have said about the rapture. And if he would have said it, and then you bring it out and his view ends up being like, poof, not the one I would have expected at all. Uh, so I was wondering if you just throw out what you put as Irenaeus's view on the assumption of the church or the rapture. Sean, I'm glad you brought it up. I actually, uh, I, 
I'll tell you in a very early planning of this book, I planned originally not to even talk about the rapture, just focus on millennium and, and futurism. And uh, maybe but that does get the major focus of the book. Right. It's not yeah. right. And yeah. and the bulk of it is uh, the millennial question yeah. and all those things. So, but I, as I was going and hemming and hawing over it, because, because like you said, it's the thing that, that dispensationalists especially get poked fun at, right? <laughs> it's, it is. And, and sometimes rightly so, because sometimes they've gone to extremes on it and such, but I, I, but poor Irenaeus and against heresies 529 one talks about the rapture and like, non-vested scholars who don't care about this stuff, they even notice it. So uh, I thought, well, he deals with it, but it's really unconventional and I got to deal with it. So the reality is sometimes people talk about being historic premillennialists and that means a premillennialist or whatever that doesn't believe in a pre-trib rapture or whatever. Um, the reality is that the historical aspect of the rapture, nobody in church history explicitly takes 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17 and places it on an eschatological timeline until Tertullian uh, around the year 200. So it's not like there's this massive consensus of everybody talking about the rapture and they're all saying post-trib or mid-trib or pre-trib. It's uh, for the most part, unlike the, like you mentioned, the millennium where there's this clear consensus starting in the first century all the way through, that's easy. You know, the balance is oh, very... Yeah. With the rapture, it's like they don't really talk about it. They're not asking the same questions as we are. Except the Irenaeus has this, when in the end the church will be suddenly cut up from this, there will be tribulation as, like the world has never seen. And he calls it the last contest of the just in which when they overcome their crown with incorruption. You can tell I've been working in this passage quite a bit. <laughs> I've tried and tried and tried to, to interpret that in some other way. And he also uses Enoch and Elijah as foreshadowing, or he says in prophecy, their catching up is a prophecy of the future uh, uh, assumption and snatching up of the of the just, of the of the righteous, of the spiritual ones. And yet, as many post-trib people like to point out, he also has the church suffering under the Antichrist. And so if you're post-trib, you say, see, Irenaeus was post-trib. If you're pre-trib, you say, see. When in the end the church is suddenly caught up from this, there will be tribulation. And so he seems to contradict himself in the way I resolve that in the chapter. And then I, and just for your, your viewers, um, by the time, you know, this book is out, I will have posted uh, the very detailed, uh, almost maybe over the top academic version of the chapter. It's a very complicated issue. But the best way to understand him is he has a different view of the church. In his view, you've got spiritual members of the church. He literally calls them at the spiritual ones who are, uh, I'm just going to say super saints, you know, they're ready, they're prepared, they're repentant, they're, they're mature. And then you have the wishy-washy carnal ones. And he says that the catching up of, of Enoch and Elijah is a foreshadowing of the future assumption of the spiritual ones. So what it, bottom line, and you'll have to read the chapter to get all the details. Uh, it seems that the best explanation is, and this is going to, in the end, make everybody unhappy. Irenaeus held to what probably is a, a partial pre-tribulation rapture with the caveat that he isn't specific as to what, how long that tribulation is. It's at least three and a half years. Uh, it could be longer. He, he's not filling in those details. So he's not answering all the questions I wish he would answer, but it looks like he's got part of the church caught up rescued because they're spiritual part of the church left behind to be purified uh, by the tribulation which again about 50 percent of your your viewers will hate that and the other 50 percent will hate it so you know he doesn't make anybody happy no but I, I i just love that it's being discussed like like i that's what i was excited about whether it's you know pre mid post like um i i just want the rapture talked about then um, from a preterm rapture position because uh, I believe that any discussion about it is overall a win for me when it comes to how I view eschatology. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. And, and to be honest, like if, if you think about a partial rapture, um, I think, I think even if you're pre-trib and you believe that all the True. genuine believers yeah. in Jesus Christ, everybody who believes in Jesus have, you know, 
put their trust in, you know, Jesus is going to be my savior and I'm going to have my faith in him. You know, you've, you've done what Paul said to the Philippian jailer. You've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Even if all of the church that are believers, if they're all raptured to the world, that's going to be a partial rapture. Yeah. From, because I you're going to have all these people in the church who never believed who yeah. they're still going to be left behind. And so there's even a, an, a vantage point where a full rapture of all believers is still a partial rapture of the church. Right. It's a, it's a, not every baptized person called a Christian is necessarily. So I say from a phenomenal logical perspective, that is from just the observant, uh, what's going to happen in Irenaeus's expectation, what I believe as a person holds to the pre-tribulation rapture, the, all of the regenerate um, it's going to look the same. Because there are going to yeah. be people who are baptized and thought they're Christians or claim to be Christians or whatever who will not be. So it's so it, it really is though. Irenaeus has a different kind of approach to e- his ecclesiology's yeah. definition of the church and and the visible church, etc. So so I, I I don't hold the Irenaeus's view because it's not my soteriology, my ecle- ecclesiology. But from an eschatological perspective, uh, you know he's kind of, he's more right than wrong. I'm going to say one thing I do want to say is. There is a trend out there that's that is trying to pull the plug on the rapture entirely and say the rapture there, there's no moment when the church will actually their feet will leave the ground. That's totally a metaphor for just yeah. you know. Uh, re- yeah, I've read that in a couple come. of books over the last. Yeah, year. and and I'll just say there's uh, one whether they were uh, premillennial, amillennial, whatever in the church, everybody all the way through the patristic period believed that there was going to be an actual assumption of the church into heaven uh, in the, upon the resurrection. So that, that idea is totally novel that, that there is no, isn't going to be a rapture. The real discussion we need to have is biblically, historically, theologically, when will that take place, you know, relative to a future tribulation period, then that, then I think we can have some productive conversations. Well, and, and then in the end, like no matter what your final view is, right. all of our, and, and the, this is, I think, a reason we want to talk about when it's going to happen is don't we just all want to be excited that Jesus is coming back for his church? And so let's have all these debates about how it's going to relate to all of these other events that are going to happen in connection with his return, because we're just frankly, we're excited mm-hmm. about his return. Like, like, even if we're off with the details, we want to be excited about him coming back. And that's one of the things that I've tried to, you know, bring out to my church whenever I talk about eschatology is like, like, this is our hope. Like, this is what we're excited about. Even if we're wrong about certain details or we differ about things. Yeah. Oh, of course. I, I, I always say, you've probably seen me tweet it, that I'm a hundred percent sure I'm wrong on some areas of theology (laughs) and I'm a hundred percent sure I'll never know what those are until, you know, yeah. it turns. I mean, it's just uh, we have to acknowledge that I don't have everything figured out. I, you know, and I, I say in the book, I'm, I'm genuinely throwing it out there as a point of conversation. Uh, I'm sure I've got weak spots and things, details wrong. I'm, I, you know, I'm punting sometimes, doing the best I can. And uh, on the big picture, I think I'm right. But uh, I also right up front, and you, you note this in the review that. Uh, the thing that holds us all together are the three R's, the crisis returning one day as judge and king. There's going to be a resurrection and a restoration of creation. And and despite even if we disagree on big things like the millennium, et cetera, we still all believe that ultimately uh, crisis returning, resurrection and uh, restoration. So we can all hang our hope on that. Yeah. And so uh, so even in our differences mm-hmm. on this and. Uh, yeah, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm trying to say is that um, I one one slight fear I might have is that somebody might be like, oh, no, Irenaeus believed in a partial rapture. So that must mean he was a nutcase. So we can't listen to him. And I do want people to be like, no, this should be like, you know, this is a reason to get excited to read about all the stuff that he said, because he's he's make, doing his best to, you know, make sense of this, figure out what's going to happen in the end. And it, it's exciting to read about him chewing through all of this in the second century. And I think it's a privilege Uh, And I'm so glad your book, you know, drew our attention to it. So I I think this is a great step forward. Uh, Do you have any plans for uh, anything that's going to follow with this? 
Uh, anything more on the fathers and eschatology? And I mean, you might be tapped yeah. out on this subject. Yeah, I mean, I plan, you know, the, there is the website, uh, fathersonthefuture.com, that pr provides all of the supplementary material. There's going to be videos and things posted. There is already videos posted up there, uh, academic articles. Um, you know, I've already kind of scheduled some conferences where I will will speak on some of these things. So um, all of that's on the website. So anything else, I, I do continue to keep doing work in there, but basically probably going to put it all on the website. There might be plans uh, of maybe doing a popular level version of the book, uh, far fewer footnotes, easier reading. Uh, as you know, the, the book is, I would say, intermediate. And then a lot of the online supplements are, are pretty advanced and academic. Um, but something that, uh, yeah. like I say, my wife would actually want to read. I think she made it to chapter eight and gave up, yeah. but uh, she raptured herself right out of that book. But, uh, <laughs> but it's it is it it it's not impossible and not inaccessible, but it does require work. This is not something you breeze through. Am no, it, it is. Yeah, it is intermediate. Um, you translate almost all the Greek and Hebrew. There's a couple of places I noted where uh, it, it doesn't get translated. Not many, just 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 a couple. Um, and, and, but the thing is like, even though you are translating it, that does shut the door for some people, even if, even if it gets translated, just having it out there. So, I mean, I, I think, I think, a uh, a, a popular level version of it, uh, could be helpful for people. Um, because one of the things about the early church fathers is the one thing I realized the first time I read through the first volume of the anti-Nicene fathers, this is not as difficult as I thought it would be. Um, and, and I, I think it would be helpful if you could let people know that this is not as above them as they might think it is. Um, but I do like it in the format that it is the, the intermediate level. I, for me, at least I think this is, yeah, I, I like it. I like it the way it is. Yeah. I think it's, it's accessible to people who are willing to put the time in. And I think yeah. e even scholars are going to have to, you know, go through, you put, you shift into low gear for this one. That's all. Um, and so I do want to, yeah, uh, once again, highlight Fathers on the Future. It's where you have all the supplemental material for this book. Uh, one of the things that I sometimes feel guilty with on Rev Reads is that I am plowing through all these brand new books um, because I don't need to purchase them because publishers send them to me. And sometimes I feel guilty uh, recommending all these books to you guys and asking you, I'm um, encouraging you to shell out enough money that you need to per take out a second mortgage. Uh, but one of the things I appreciate about the fathers on the future is that even if you're in a place where you can't drop down the initial money to purchase the book right now, there's tons of material from it out there on the fathers in the future that you can read right now. Although I do encourage you to get the book because I think the book is great. Um, but this is one of those where there's, there's plenty of material right out there for everybody uh, that you can have right now. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Spiegel for spending this time here with us on Rev Reads. It was great to have you. And I want to say if you're new to the channel and you haven't subscribed yet, uh, subscribe to Rev Reads so that you can see more about uh, the books that I'm working through, the reviews, author interviews. We would love to have you out there. And if you want more people to know about the fathers on the future and about what's in this book, share this review so that more people can know about it. Thanks again for coming on the channel.